Mega Man is a classic old-school side-scrolling jump-and-shoot game with the theme of getting stronger as you progress. You run to the right, you jump, you shoot, you get items as you defeat smaller enemies, and you get power-ups as you defeat bosses. But how do you transform a side-scrolling game like this into a tabletop board game while still making it feel like Mega Man? The folks at Blacklist Games tickled their creative noodles to come up with a way to accurately capture the tropes of classic Mega Man gameplay. You run, you jump, you shoot, you take a hit and walk on spikes for a few frames to get to the next room. They captured all of it. Best of all, the game is designed to be played either solo or with up to four players. That alone makes getting a game in super easy. What does the game itself look like? And is it fun to play? How do I play it? Let's jump in and take a look. For today, we're going to be taking a look at what all comes in the box, talk about what parts are used, and run through a quick guide on how the game would be played. First, let's look at the box. It's pretty tongue-in-cheek here, designed after an NES cartridge. It's a good sturdy box though, and the lid comes off easy, which is sadly more than I can say for some other board games out there. The plastic insert in the Mega Man 1 through 3 boxes inside will make it easy to set up and put up. However, if you do like to sleeve your cards, like I do, you'll run into storage issues in a few spots. I made a solution that works for myself, and I'll cover that later. Be aware, this game does take up a lot of space on the table. There are many cards that will be constantly moving, so you'll want a cleaned off table to set this up. First things first. The biggest draw in the box are going to be the three boxes that look like title screens from the Mega Man series. On the back of them, they even have the boss stage selects. That's a nice touch in my opinion. If your cards get mixed up, some people might not know what all bosses go with which games. Inside these boxes are your boss cards, but more importantly, there is your hero decks and acrylic stands. In total, there are four stands, one for each player, and they look great. Mega Man, Proto Man, Rush, and Roll are all playable characters. Each one has a unique deck that is tailored to their playstyle, as well as each of them having a unique ability. As much as I like the acrylic stands, with how I store my copy, they don't quite fit in the box. But the old figurines from the Jasco brand Mega Man board game do. And frankly, that board game is nearly unplayable. So these are a fun means to actually use the great looking miniatures. There is a huge array of cardboard pop-outs here. Most of these are used on your player card to keep track of, you know, everything. The health pellets are used to keep your life in check. The blue, red, yellow Mega Mans are used to determine which tokens are active. The E-Tanks are kept in the middle of the board and used when needed by any player. The surprise boxes that I now see have a big old glare on them also sit in the middle of the game awaiting to be used when conditions are met. The one-up head is the first player icon. And lastly, all those weapon energies are stacked up to three on your player cards for each energy slot. Frankly, these get in the way and I found it much easier to just grab some dice and use that to keep track of your weapon energy. Each hero deck contains 16 cards. The back of them have the character's name and picture, so it's easy to tell whose deck you have. Conveniently, Jesco Games years ago made sleeves of each of these characters. I sleeved my heroes in their appropriate sleeves, as I've been looking for a use for these sleeves for a while now. I sleeved the rest of the game in Dragon Shield Matte Clear. The other decks are the boss pattern deck, which is used to determine what a boss does when you fight one. Dr. Light's deck, which is only used if there are less than three players, acts as a third, or in a solo game, two other players, to round out the support slots. The Sabotage deck is used only when you want to up the difficulty of the game. There are bigger cards at the bottom of the box, which are used as stages. And there are mini cards here that have all of the special weapons and starting weapons for the game. Well, not a deck. There is a card for every robot master from Mega Man 1 through 3 as well as four Wily Fortress bosses per game. The game uses its own custom dice. There are three colors, and each contain a collection of three symbols, with each of them having a higher chance of getting a particular one. The blue dice focus on jumping and have more jumping actions, as well as the double jump side. Yellow focuses on running, and lastly red focuses on shooting. If you find yourself needing a particular action type, it's ideal to focus on that colored die as it'll give you the best chance for success. Now that we've seen everything in the box, 
let's take a look at what the game itself is like. First and foremost, there are two ways to play the game. Single games are designed to be fast and simple. The goal here is to work together to defeat your robot master. Once all bosses are defeated, all players win. However, if one player loses, you all lose. The other game mode is called campaign mode. Here you will play the game in sessions, which is just their fancy way of saying levels. Once more you work as a team, but if you die, you just restart your stage. Depending on the number of players, there is a pool of E-Tanks everyone can draw from when your HP hits zero. When you play in campaign mode, you will go through the normal game twice. However, you have limited starting weapon. Each time you defeat a Robot Master, you acquire the special weapon to use in the next level. After two regular rounds, you'll play a third round, and you'll face off with Dr. Wily. Rather than play through a stage on this one, though, you'll battle a Robot Master first, then you'll face a Dr. Wily card, which can range anywhere from Yellow Devil, Mega Dragon, or even Wily himself. Thumping Wily wins the game. In this mode, if you die, and there are no E-Tanks, you simply restart your level. So the majority of the game is played off of symbols or icons, rather than words. Let's go over what these icons are. Jump, shoot, and run are your standard actions that you will roll off of dice or spend with tokens. Hourglasses can be overcome by any two of the same actions. Surprise Tank is a prize you can earn. The red, blue, and yellow cubes represent dice of that color. A die with all three colors shown may be whatever die you choose. Anything with an action in a square gives you a die of that color on that exact face. No need to roll! Weapon Energy adds one to your special weapon points, if not maxed out. Life Pelts heal you one point of HP. The Mega Man token symbol means you activate that token on your player card, and if it says any, with all three colors, then it's your choice. The burst symbol is how many ticks of damage you were dealt. Lastly, there's a skull symbol that is used for the boss's attacks. To set up the game, you'll place your player card in front of you, and equip your starting weapon. For normal quick games, you'll just draw randomly from the special weapon deck. And in campaign mode, you will shuffle the four starting weapons and draw one of them. You'll place three energy tokens in your active weapon slot. Place an energy HP icon on the number 5 for your HP. Place three action type pop-ups in their respective spots with their gray, deactive, side up. The acrylic stand will also go on your card. Set your player deck next to your card and place the dice, all surprise tanks, and required energy tanks, as well as if needed the Dr. Light deck, in the center. Remove the Dr. Wily boss cards and shuffle all the Robot Master cards then draw four, placing them stage side up in the center. The players from here will pick which stage of the master that they want to face. Once everyone has their master, place them stage side up above your card and draw four stage cards. Keep these stacked together so that you can only see the top one. If you choose to up the difficulty, draw the needed number of sabotage cards. Otherwise, leave the sabotage deck in the box. You're now ready to start playing! The goal of the game is to overcome the challenge presented to you on your stage and boss cards. Each stage card is broken up into three segments each with their own challenges shown at the top. To overcome these, you must spend dice or tokens to meet the requirements shown. If you fail to overcome a challenge, you will suffer the damage shown below. If you overcome one with a surprise tank, you'll draw one surprise tank at random and gain its effects. Afterwards, discard the surprise tank token. Even if you fail the spot that you are on and you take damage, you proceed forward. Because we've all taken a hit in Mega Man and just kept running to use that invincibility time to get to the next room. The boss card that you drew at the beginning should be set next to the stage. This card is always in effect and will affect every stage card you run through until you reach the boss themselves. 
The first part of the game is the draw phase, where you draw four cards from your action deck. Next is the planning phase. Here you can discuss with the other players what they can and want to do. If you are playing with the Dr. Light deck, you'll draw four cards from it now and place them in the center so everyone can see them. Now that all the options are on the table, play the best build you can for the stage you are going through. Your action cards have two functions to them. The top is called the support, while the bottom is called the skill. You'll play these two cards in the support slot, both left and right. When you play a card here, only the top part, the support, you see what they did there, is active. One card is played in the skill slot, and as you might have guessed, only the bottom part is used. The last card remains in your hand to be played when needed. If you are playing solo, you will take two Dr. Light cards and put them next to each of your support cards. If you're in a two-player game, you each will take one and place it on the side that the Dr. Light deck is located. Dr. Light cards provide you with what is displayed on top, but he comes at a price. The lower part, there's a cube that will be shown in a damage symbol. If that card is not connected to a support with that color equipped, you will suffer one damage. Once everyone has played their cards and set up Dr. Light cards if needed, you move on to the action phase. Place your standee in the far left section of your stage tile. Starting with the player with the first player token, they will attempt to run through their stage. To begin, you will generate your dice based on the support cards you played, as well as the players to your left and right on what they have on their supports that are closest to you. How this works is simple. Your right support card affects the player on your right, and likewise, your left is for your player on your left. This is a two-way street, as what they put in those spots will help you. Once you have your dice, you will roll and work with what you get. You can spend a weapon energy to reroll any number of dice if the results are undesirable. You can discard the card in your skill slot during this time and use its effects, paying for any cost if required. You can spend any number of weapon points to use your weapon as needed. The card in your hand is referred to as a boost card. During any player's turn, you can discard it to use either the support or the skill shown to affect the active player. Alright. So let's run through a standard turn in the game. After drawing and setting up cards, this is Mega Man's opening turn. In this instance, Mega Man is getting a red and a blue die from himself, a blue die from Rush, and a yellow and blue die from Proto Man at the cost of one damage. With all these dice though, there's a good chance he can overcome this stage card. After rolling, Mega here has four shoot and two jumps enough to get through the last two parts of the stage card, but needs some run to get past the first. As well, Bomb Man's stage effect is triggered, and Mega Man rolled two or more jumps. He's hit by a bomb! Now that the dice are rolled, it's time to find a way through this. Spending one weapon energy, Mega Man may re-roll the yellow die as it has the best chance for running. The re-roll becomes a double run, exactly what was needed to pass the challenge. Mega Man stand moves to the second part of the card, and it appears that all Mega Man needed here was a jump. Now there was two of these rolled, sadly, because that's what made him take damage from Bomb Man, but with that he's able to jump over the mat. Lastly, Big Eye stands here in his way. Mega Man needed two of anything to bypass the hourglass, and then he needs two shoot to take out the Big Eye. It's almost like he needs to wait and slide underneath it or wait for its eye to open and fire away. Hmm. Well, the dice that are left is one jump and three shoots. Just barely too little. But wait, the Mega Buster! Spending one weapon energy point, Mega Man gains a red die that is already set to the shoot icon. With this, he can spend the four shoot icons to overcome this and complete a stage card. Before he spends his dice, though, Mega Man chooses to be selfish, and play his boost card from his hand for the skill effect to activate his running token. After completing the stage card, Mega Man gets to draw a surprise token and immediately gain its effects, 
which get him one special weapon energy point. The stage card is now discarded, and the one underneath it becomes the next one to tackle. Any extra dice are also discarded. Now, the next player clockwise becomes the active player. This continues until all players have gone through their turns. After the last player in the round goes, all cards in the support, skill, and your hand are discarded, and four new ones are drawn in the next draw phase. Active tokens, however, get to stay. Once all stage cards have been completed, it's time to face the Robot Master. For this round, you'll flip the boss card over to their boss side and read what they can do. Bomb in here makes every card deal you an extra damage. Now the goal here is to simply survive. It is assumed your Mega Man is firing like crazy, pressing B as fast as you can, keeping those shots flying all the time. We've all done it. We've all spammed shots in the boss room. So does this game. To start the boss phase, you will draw cards from the boss pattern deck equal to the number shown in the corner of the boss card. Just like the stages, stack the cards on top of each other so you can only see the top one. The draw phase and planning phase are exactly the same. There are two new things in boss battles to look out for. The first one is the skull icon. These will be on the boss pattern cards. They indicate what the symbol should be by looking at the boss's card. So, for Bomb Man, all skulls are considered running. The other is the weakness for the boss, shown under the number on their card. If you have a special weapon with that icon, you can spend a weapon energy to gain any die of your choosing. Once you finish the planning step, it's time to run through the boss pattern. Here, Mega is going to go in with two red and two yellow dice. After rolling, he has three running and two shooting. Not bad, but not what we need for the first card, which required two jumping. Unable to overcome this card, Mega Man takes two damage plus one from Bomb Man for a total of three damage. Yikes, that's a lot of damage! That boss pattern card is then discarded, and Mega Man moves on to the next. Here, he has to overcome a running and a skull, which means running. He has three running dice, so this is an easy pass. Next, a shoot and a skull, er, shoot and a run. While he has the tools to complete this one, for the sake of teaching, Mega Man takes the hit of three, and would then explode. He was at one HP, and takes the first point of damage. Thankfully, there are eatings left, and using one refills him to full HP. However, the remaining damage is still coming in, so he takes more, putting him at 3 HP. Moving on to the last card in the stack. A running and two of anything. Completing this challenge gives us a prize tank too! Now, Mega Man has all the needed components left in his dice, or even just with the double shoot dice and the running token. However, for the sake of showing off how things work, we're gonna not do that, you're just gonna assume our dice are all gone. Taking a hit of four is super duper bad, but Proto Man offers a solution. If Mega Man can get a jump, he can help him out. Thankfully in hand, Mega Man has a skill that lets him activate his jump token. Spending his card, he does just that. Proto Man now plays one of his unique cards on Mega Man's turn, the Proto Shield. Using the skill part of it, for the cost of a jump, two damage can be prevented. Mega Man spends his recently acquired jump token and puts up the Proto Shield with the jump just like it came straight out of Mega Man 10 and blocks some damage. Just enough, too. The challenge wasn't overcome, so the surprise tank isn't gained. Mega Man survived Bomb Man's boss pattern. This means he won! <laughs> Now he just waits out to assist any other players until the game is over. If playing in campaign mode, Mega Man would then look through the special weapon deck and find Bomb Man's special weapon, Hyper Bomb. He would then add it to one of his weapon slots. The next session that is played, Mega Man would have both the Mega Buster and Hyper Bomb. And that's the gist of the game. And what do I think of it? Well, I think it feels like Mega Man. From the Proto Shield requiring a jump to activate, to jumping too much in Bomb Man's stage, it has its flavor down pat. It takes some thinking, though, 
to get through some of the challenges and proper resource management. Like In a way, it feels kind of like Sentinels of the Multiverse, but a little bit more chaotic. I do think that each player's deck makes that character stand out, and some of them play really well together. Mega Man has healing cards in his deck, as well as a focus on tokens, which makes him a good support for Roll, who focuses on certain face dice and weapon energy. Roche is all about support, and is a major help to Proto Man, who is full of self-sabotaging cards for high risk, high reward. The more you play, the more you'll get a groove going for what combos with what. I also really like that there's a difficulty to scale the game. Rather than making house rules, or some bosses to the point of just not being fun, you can adjust the game for your playgroup. If Little Joe gets mad when he loses, but really likes Quick Man, he can battle Quick Man, and you can toss the game in easy mode so everyone wins. If you have a playgroup that enjoys brutal challenges, say no more, the Dr. Wily deck is ready to wreck your day. There are a lot of moving parts in this game though, and it's not super convenient to move them as needed. As well, without sleeves, sliding cards under the player card is surprisingly a pain. The box they come in also doesn't house a fully sleeved game, which is always a pet peeve of mine. However, if you do remove the title screen boxes that in my opinion have little structure and are likely going to fall apart anywho, you can fit in some deck boxes. Here's how I set my game up once I sleeved everything. First, the boxes went into the Mega Man Collection display case. I'm not messing with them. Next. The standees I said I wasn't going to be using in favor of the Jasco figures, so I discovered that they, as well as the bases that they came in, can fit under the plastic insert, just under the race section. The stage cards should go in the bottom, but once sleeved, they just slightly don't fit, so I filled it with the needed cardboard pop-outs that were not surprise tanks. The spot where the dice went is now filled with the surprise tanks, for ease of keeping them together and separate. The dice stay in their baggie and sit where the Dr. Light deck and boss pattern cards went. The mini cards stay in their home because they actually fit there when sleeved. There's a hollow L shape that I think was supposed to be for the cardboard pop-outs, but being as nothing else lived in there, now the Jezgo figures do. Lastly, in the big open spot I fit deck boxes. I was able to fit all my cards in a sidewinder and a dragon shield sleeve box. Three dragon shield boxes, or three Ultra Pro plastic boxes, or two Ultimate Guard plastic boxes, all fit as well. Depending on what you have on hand, this could be an option for you. The boxes do come flush with the top part of the plastic, allowing for the player cards and rulebook to set perfectly on top. Would I recommend this game? Well, it's not going to be a game for everyone. But it is simple enough, yet challenging enough, that most people might enjoy a round of it here and there. If you like Mega Man and you enjoy board games, you'll likely enjoy it, as it has the proper feel. If you don't know Mega Man, then the game is likely going to rate somewhere in probably about, I don't know, 3 out of 5? If you don't like competitive games, but enjoy a group challenge, then this is up your alley. I'm a diehard Mega Man fan, so this is right up my alley. I'm going to keep playing it until I defeat every boss in the game.